it was a, it was kind of a, a tenuous thing because at that time Iceland was 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 the, the focal point of a great deal of news because here we were not in war and we were going up into a combat zone of the war in Europe and accordingly they, the all of the newspapers including the New York Times and the AP UP and INS and so forth had their reporters up there so we had a, quite a large contingent of um, news people and suddenly we got a call one day that um, we hadn't been up there only about two months I guess and I got a call at an emergency that the from the Navy that the German submarines had torpedoed the USS Kearney which is a destroyer American destroyer and uh, a general called me in and said that uh, we better get out there and take a look at it but it was a bit of a problem how are we going to get out there and look at it you know with the submarines around there so uh, what we did we went down and got the, the chief of police and uh, he, he gave us a fishing Icelandic fishing trawler so that we could the Germans wouldn't shoot at an Icelandic fishing trawler you know and I went out there and, and, and the carney was indeed it was badly badly damaged with several casualties Americans killed on, on board the destroyer I came back to the base at Iceland. Then the problem was, how do we keep this from the newspaper men? Because this means it's an act of war, and we're not in war. So uh, we tried to keep it as much as we could within ourselves and get all the information back to Washington and let them make the decisions of how they wanted to handle it. And it was successful that we did that. The newspaper people, of course, were unhappy at the fact that we didn't give them the news, but uh, it was a very, a very tenuous time because uh, it could have been something that we could have made big stories out of it and maybe aroused the American people that here you know, the Germans are sinking our, our warships, you know. Uh, then it wasn't too long after that that uh, he, um, we shot down a, a, a Fock Wolf German airplane, a four-engine four plane, over Iceland and uh, it was up in the mountains and near the glaciers and uh, I had the assignment of take a contingent of men up there to see what, if anything, was recoverable or was a living soldiers of the Germans and so forth and it took us a couple of days to get up to it and maybe longer than that it was very difficult traveling in that, that type of terrain but I got up there and of course the, the, the Germans were were all killed uh, and I uh, had the uh, remains of everything searched as far as we could and I found one very important code book which was a, extremely important. I, I didn't realize the importance at the time, although I knew it was a code book, and I, I, uh, I, I took it myself, and, uh, and after a few days got back down to the base, base headquarters again, and uh, then we, we saw that we really had something because all of the codes of the Germans uh, for the airplanes to the submarines and all sorts of things, here was the German code all handed to us, you know. And when we when we telegraphed our, our headquarters over in uh, in London, and they got excited, sent a B-24 up and sent me down with the with the code book, and I turned it over to them, and they uh, they in turn, of course, got it to Metzley Park and other places, and it turned out to be a a real a real boon to the to the uh, people who were coding decoding of the Germans, because it told everything everything it was. It was a little bit difficult at that time because while I went into Paris early, probably first uh, to get into there, because I flew in from Normandy on an L5 uh, airplane, a little uh, one motor job, recon plane, reconnaissance plane, and uh, the pilot, I was, I was told, uh, well, I, I ordered, I, I was told anyway by FFI that we could get into Paris that most of the Germans were gone, and um, 
I thought maybe we'd get somebody in there, and we had a meeting, and I decided I could get into Paris with this plane. So we took a, an L-5, and uh, the pilot said, well, I, I have no maps to get in there. I don't know how I'm going to get in there. I have no aviation maps to get into Paris or over the landing field or anything else. And what? Well, we looked it all over, and uh, we found out there was a railroad track where we were very close by. That track went right into Paris. So I said, well, I'll navigate and you pilots. And, and we followed the railroad tracks into in Paris. And the poor guy on the suburb of Paris, we found a place that was, uh, maybe it was an athletic field or something, but it was certainly a nice open ground. And we landed there. And uh, But anyway, I hadn't landed any more than a few minutes, it seemed that the FFA was informed I was coming there. And uh, they met me in their car crazy bunch of people. I think five of that automobile waving flags and banners and all kinds of stuff. They were the underground people and uh, they met me and uh, was of course happy to see some of America, first Americans they'd seen. And they were going to take me back into Paris and we rode into Paris in that car. I suppose we hadn't gone any more than a couple, three miles and I heard bang. I thought, oh boy, they caught us. They know we're here. The enemy sure does. They're after me, you know. After us, and we went further, and another great big bang, and I, I got very nervous. They saw I was nervous. They, they didn't appear nervous, but I was nervous. Then they explained to me that their automobile wasn't using gasoline. It was some kind of a charcoal engine that they had for the automobile. And it backfired and made big spurts about every every several miles, you know. And I was quite relieved by that. The Germans had satellite, the little satellite concentration camps that they put women in, you know. And uh, one of the, we ran into one of those, it was like a huge big barracks. And they were full of women, so we went into those women. And uh, I got in, I went into that place, those women, they were just crazy to see us, you know. One of them grabbed my hand so much, he just kept grabbing, scratching, she made my hand bleed, you know. From, from the, I carried that for a long time, but. Uh, they had those little those camps where they put different prisoners in there. I, I don't think anyone can go through um, <clears throat> four years of overseas war without uh, having viewed probably the worst parts of that war. Uh, I think probably um, being the uh, <clears throat> early arrival into uh, the, the concentration in camp at Dachau was just something that um, seems to stay with me more than most anything else. <clears throat> I had other events that happened, of course, and uh, that's natural But uh, in wartime. But somehow this was so um, so different in life uh, to, 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 to see that uh, what man can do to his fellow man and what a nation can do like, to its own people uh, is something that is so, so great and so profound in memory that uh, it probably is, is, is the most vivid event that I do remember uh, out of all, of all of the various things that I've been a part of. It does come back to me very often for, for no particular reason and, and no particular time. And, uh, I, uh, I'm not haunted by it, but I'm, um, I'm guided in some things in my life by what did happen there and, and what does happen. You also must see, though, the, uh, the things that have remained constant about our country that are good uh, between the 1930s and today. Um, what, what do you think has been constant through your life? It's the ability of our people to be innovative. And I think that we have done that. We've been a leader in so many things, electronics and so forth, that we have not lost that spirit. The spirit of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurship continues to exist. And a great deal of leadership is, is manifesting itself in, in some places, but not always in the proper places. But I think that that uh, these, these factors still exist today, and it's somewhat inherent in the spirit of the American people. What 
would be your message to young people today uh, to uh, give them hope and to, uh, to guide them? Well, I would hope that they would, uh, first of all, really get an education. It's very important that they have a good education. And they, they really do try to, to, to get themselves organized in a, in a way that they think they're going to make the greatest contribution, not alone to themselves, but, but to their, 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 their own community and to their country. Uh, and, and be faithful to uh, your religious background if you have one. I think the, the, you find the, the standards of organizations or whatever it may be uh, th that are high in principle that they can pursue and follow them. Be, act be active in your, your community. Uh, be a contributor to uh, many things. And uh, take it within, do it with integrity and, and uh, happiness.